Hello, happy almost Halloween. I'm Adam Caesar, and no question of the week this week because this is a very special week where I'm not going to be talking at you all that much. This is a previously recorded, this was live. This is a panel that I had the pleasure of being on um, with the Westport Library and my fellow authors. Uh, it is uh, 2020. Uh, we had books coming out, COVID. Uh, makes doing in-person panels and conventions and all that kind of stuff a little bit difficult uh, but thankfully we have stuff like Crowdcast which is what we recorded this on and we have places like the Westport Library which is in Westport Connecticut uh, somewhere in Connecticut I'm not familiar I don't know I don't know where that is uh, but it sounds like a beautiful library uh, sounds like an amazing place and they do a lot of on online events I'll put the link down to their website down below uh, and the, the, the events uh, moderator there uh, Alex uh, Giannini uh, was kind enough to reach out to me and he also reached out to Lorreen Lawrence who wrote The Stitchers. This is a middle grade book. Um, if you have younger kids, if you have uh, uh, younger teens, uh, this is a perfect, perfect, perfect Halloween read for them. Uh, Stephen King blurbed it. He said the chills come guaranteed. That's wild. That's really cool. Uh, so you're going to get to hear from her. You're going to hear from Laurel Hightower who is an adult author, uh, an adult horror author. She wrote uh, Crossroads which is just out now. Uh, I'll put the links down to all these books. Laurel is also one of the hosts of the Ink Heist podcast, which is a very good podcast. Uh, I was on it. Uh, you should go listen and subscribe to that. And uh, and the last but certainly not least, uh, Kat Ellis. And Kat actually lives in Wales, uh, so it was midnight when we were recording this. Yeah, I'll put the links to all of our books, uh, including mine, Clown in the Cornfield, which we talk a little bit about on the panel. I'll put the links down there in either Amazon or uh, Bookshop, which uh, Bookshop helps helps local indies out. Yeah, get them wherever books are sold. Please uh, support these authors. Please buy these books. Uh, and I think you're going to really like what they have to say. Uh, the quality on this is pretty good. So it's not going to be like, you know, perfect me talking to you, talking into my phone quality. Uh, but the quality on this is pretty good. I'm just going to let it roll and enjoy it. Yeah, enjoy the uh, the video. It's, uh, it's a nice conversation. We talk about a lot, a lot of different stuff. Uh, some of it's funny, some of it's quite serious, um, and people sometimes ask questions down in the comments about like craft and about like how I write or how writers go about getting published or things like that. This is the video where we're going to talk about that because we talk about it for an hour. We talk about all that kind of stuff. Uh, so enjoy it. Uh, check it out. Uh, check all these authors out. They're great. It was a great conversation. Thank you so much uh, to the Westport Library for having me, um, and it's just just really an honor. Uh, so thank you so much. Go watch that and enjoy. Hello and welcome, and thank you all for being here this evening. My name is Alex Giannini, and I'm the manager of programs and events at the Westport Library. I'm so excited and honored to welcome our four authors tonight. They've written four very different horror novels that highlight why the genre is perhaps at its very best right now. Before I make our introductions, though, a quick note. Um, if you've got a question for any of our authors tonight, please use the Ask a Question feature that's right below me, uh, and we'll do our best to get to it at some point in the evening. And now for the main event. Adam Caesar's latest, the YA slasher Clown in a Cornfield, is one of the most hyped horror releases of the year. Not only does it live up to that hype, but it is not at all what you think it is. While Clown is his first YA, Adam's got a murderer's row of great adult horror fiction as well. And his YouTube channel is the place to find your next weekend horror movie binge. Laurel Hightower's Crossroads be begins with a gut punch and continues right on down that devastating and impossible to, to turn away from road. Laurel also co-hosts the Ink Heist podcast, a horror and writing show that delivers some of the very best interviews in the field. Stephen King said that the chills in Laurie and Lawrence's middle grade novel, The Stitchers, come guaranteed. I don't know about you, but I always listen to my Uncle Stevie. And if you're at all like me, then The Stitchers will leave you feeling like you did when... Uh, the Stitchers will leave you feeling like you did when you first walked down Fear Street or when you huddled around the TV to watch Are You Afraid of the Dark? Cat Ellis's Harrow Lake creeps up on you like a cold autumn evening and leaves and surrounds you like leaves on a sidewalk. Her writing is beautifully haunting and the world she creates is at atmospheric. And if you've read the book, then you already know that it is all optimal. She is also coming with us from the future because she's in the UK and it's past midnight. So thank, thank you so much for being here. And welcome to all of you, and thank you all for being here. Let's get, let's start at the start. Um, let's talk about influences. Um, what was your first exposure to the horror genre? Why don't we go 
Lorian first and then just go around. Sorry. Okay. My first exposure to the horror genre was like inappropriately young. I was in kindergarten and we were, it was the eighties and there were like no rules. So we were all in this basement library and our librarian took all us kindergartners, sat us down on the carpet and he read to us from scary stories to tell in the dark. Um, and I was, we were all like, mm, like, frozen and in retrospect like i'm a teacher and i've read some of them to my seventh graders and they're terrified and so i don't know it made an impression though like i totally became obsessed with folklore and urban legends and things like that and then i got into rl stein like the older i got and then Anne rice and stephen king etc but the first time i ever remember being like what is that i need more of this in my life this seems a bit naughty like i'm not gonna tell my mom that he sorry mom but that's what happened in kindergarten and he just totally just went through and read them all and yeah it must have stuck <laughs> <laughs> how about you adam i i love that and i had a very similar experience it's not not quite my first exposure but like I think first for me, I kind of came at it through film um, and um, I love horror movies and I still love horror movies and I really like try to split kind of equal time between enjoying horror film and enjoying horror fiction. Um, but uh, like so very early was just like going to the supermarket and there being a little kiosk of rental videotapes and like loving the, 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 the art and like being scared of the art on like the, you know, the Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street movies. But um, at school, we had a we had a librarian read us um, very specifically. She read us the picture book version of the Taley Poe, which is one of those folk stories that 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 gets retold in uh, one of the I think the third scary stories to tell in the dark. But she did like this crazy, evocative reading of this storybook to like children, young children, and I just remember it's scaring the hell out of me um, because it, the Taley Poe is not like a bloodless story. It does end and and feature violence like throughout so it's i just really remember that it's and something uh Lorraine said like reminded me of that um so yeah i think it's it, i think car is like the thing that gets its hooks in you early and it and it does feel a little transgressive um so how about you kat well like adam um my first real introduction to horror was through films more than books um i remember when i was little my dad had this massive vhs collection of horror movies all the big ones you know halloween friday the 13th hellraiser all of those big you know franchise horror films and i was watching these as a really small kid in the 80s you know just entirely inappropriate to be watching these things <laughs> Um, and it wasn't until I was a teenager, really, that I started to read horror, and it was all the point horror books, Christopher Pike and things mm. like that. So, yeah, that's what got me into reading it. Laurel? Yeah, I'm, I always love hearing from everybody how they got into horror, because it's just kind of like nostalgic. But um, I, uh, I think actually probably the first one I can remember is there was my parents had bought a um, it was like a, a spoken word, um, I guess it was a storyteller thing, and it was all horror folklore. Um, and uh, we were pretty little, I think, but I still, I mean, I can still remember her delivery of some of the lines on that. And once they got that, that was all we wanted to listen to. It's just like every car trip, we just listened to, you know, the spoken word um, uh, horror tales. And then, yeah, there was just horror all over my house. So just kind of dove in from there. It's amazing how it just sticks with you. Um, it's just kind of so following that thread, we'll start with Laurel this time. But um, so what was the work in, in any medium that made you want to work in the horror genre and write in the horror genre, I should say? I don't know if that would be a specific one. I think it's more just that um, I just I love ghost stories. I absolutely love ghost stories. I love a whole um, realm and, and range of horror, uh, but ghosts, you, you can always get me in with a haunted house. So I think it was just more, um, I have, uh, there's a, there's an Irish movie called the eclipse. That is one of the best ghost stories I've ever seen. And, um, I think it was just looking at stuff like that and thinking, I want to, I want to make people jump like that. Cat. Um, 
I wouldn't say that I specifically set out to write horror. I tend to write the story as it needs to be and then, you know, the powers that be just fit it into whatever genre it mm. fits into. Um, my other books that I've written before, Harrow Lake, have all been sort of very dark, thrillery type books, but this one just kind of overstepped that line, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I think it was kind of inevitable that I would go that far um, in the end anyway. Hmm. So uh, just to, to jump in for a sec, so did you start out writing Harrow Lake as a thriller or, or did you always think it was the idea there that, that it was going to be a horror story? Didn't even give it a thought. I, I just hmm. tend to write the story as it needs to be told. And then, you know, it, it changed so many times when I was writing Harrow Lake. Um, there's a, a film in the book called Nightjar, which mm -hmm. tells, you know, a very different story. It's a, a film that's sort of referenced in it. But the first draft of Harrow Lake, it was much more like the story of Nightjar. So it changed an awful lot during mm -hmm. uh, the writing process. Interesting. Um, so, Adam, was there was there a work that, that kind of made you think, uh, you know, this is what I want to do? Probably kind of several. And I guess all of them before, like I hit the one were kind of subliminal. Um, I, I, it's weird to have a specific answer for this, but I have like a acutely specific answer and can remember that I was reading this book um, on the Amtrak train from Boston to uh, New York for like some holiday break because I was going to school up in Boston and I'd, um, I'd been like writing and I'd, I, I, it's weird because I'd been writing at the time, but I'd been writing like short stories and stuff, but I read um, I, it, like maybe freshman year of uh, college, I'd read um, Joe Lansdale's The Drive-In and i was like oh like this is exactly what i want to do like this is exactly um the, not not just like because it's a it's a fantastic book but just the like the weird the the way that it mixes tones and and things and the way that it's so reverent to horror film and it talks about horror film but it doesn't feel like a movie it doesn't feel like a it doesn't feel like an annotated screenplay like i love that kind of writing and I love that writing that doesn't shy away from being literature, but also it feels sim cinematic in a way. And, and this feels like it's in conference with uh, movies. So like I read that book and I was like, I'm just going to try to rip this off forever. And that's the, the 10 years later crowd cast. <laughs> <laughs> Lorian, how about you? I can't pinpoint one, but I, I was writing like adult stuff, like very literary, I don't know, really pretentious stuff. And I wasn't having much fun and I was getting like nowhere with it. And so then I moved back to the town I grew up in that Stephen King also grew up in, which Alex also, to call you out, but you live in. And um, yeah, and it, it, there's something very haunting about Stratford. Like there's so much folklore just in that town itself. And like walking the streets where I was a middle schooler, like where I grew up, I was like very inspired by what did I like when I was a kid? What, what do I really enjoy reading? Not what do I think I should be writing, but like, what would I want to read? And we started to go to this place called Book Barn in Connecticut, which is like these old buildings that just have all like used books and like you can find point horror and you can find old rl stein and christopher pikes and i had like a big old collection and i started rereading them and it just took me back and i was like okay this is what this is what i want to do i just want to have fun and so the first kids book i wrote is the stitchers and i just wrote it kind of like to get back in touch with the kind of stuff that I like to read when I was a kid. And that's the one that sold. So it's kind of funny how it works out that way. Um, so kind of moving along with that, I, I'm interested in, I love like writer origin stories. So I guess I want to ask all of you, let's start with, with you, Lauren. When, um, so what was like your, your first published piece, your, you know, your first professional work and how did it come about? this <laughs> i had um i've been writing forever it's not the first book i wrote i wrote i don't even know how many and i never got an agent with this book either like that was other books um 
I, timing is so much in this business. And I don't think I appreciated that when I was younger, like how there wasn't a massive middle grade horror market when I was first trying to get this published. But I also don't think it was ready. If I go back and look at those first drafts of the stitchers, it was then called bits and pieces. And it was a bit of a mess. And so I feel like I did need time to kind of grow and get, you know, used to that genre more in this age group. Um, so I don't really have a long history in terms of publishing because I'm a newbie and yay, debuting in 2020 has been so fun. Oh, we will get to that. I have a <laughs> Add a bit that. of space to it. Yeah. But my publishing journey is short. Not the writing journey though. I do want to stress that. Like it took me 10 years to get an agent of like solid, just writing, writing, writing and querying. And then two years after that to get the book deal. So. So I, I have to ask just to jump. I always jump in on you, Adam. I'm sorry. But uh, so what was it like to get the blurb from Stephen King? I got it in my classroom. Oh, my, yeah, I probably shouldn't admit this as often as I do. But I yeah, bad teacher. I had my phone out because I was timing them. They were doing something where I was timing them, I swear. And my editor like she, her, her subject line was just Stephen King loved your book. And I just started the screen in the class because it just popped up and my students they freaked out I think I was with an eighth grade class at the time and they just freaked out and I still don't quite believe it like he I don't I'm looking at it I see it right now and I'm like I can't believe that's a thing that's on my book but I love that I kind of had that bad teacher moment because I got to like share that experience with the kids I'm writing for essentially so it was, it was pretty rad. <laughs> I, I, okay, so Adam, how about you, your writer's journey? What does it look like? Um, I, I started in like, um, just like I, I mentioned before that I was writing short stories, but I was just sending uh, short stories out. Um, uh, weirdly enough, because like, uh, I guess like, as like fanboyish, I'd met like J Jack Ketchum at a convention and I was like, how do you get, how do you start writing? And he's just like, write short stories and send them out. And like the market was, you know, and I, I'm, the short story market is still weird. Um, but I was, I, I, I sold a couple stories to kind of um, smaller magazines and um, and kind of like DIY magazines. Um, and then I'd um, I'd started writing a novel, and I did I did a draft of that. And while I was looking for a publisher for that, I'd um, uh, John Skip of Skip Inspector. Um, one of the original splatterpunks mm. i was friends with him on facebook um and and he had announced that he was looking for short um short novels uh novellas for this line that he was editing and he's like they should read at about the same time it takes to watch a movie like punchy fast cinematic and i was like oh that's what i want to do anyway so i had i dm'd him on facebook and basically pitched a book and, and phrased it in such a way that i pretended that i had written it already or that i had a manuscript already and he was like, that's great. Let's do it. Uh, let me see it. And I was like, give me a minute. And then in a month, I wrote, um, I wrote Tribesman, uh, which is what I pitched him. And then Tribesman, like the publishing taking so long and being weird. So it wasn't the first book I wrote, but it was the first book that came out. Um, and that was, um, so it, was, it kind of did a lot of small press stuff, like small to medium press stuff. And publishers would keep going out of business and book rights would keep coming back to me. And, um, so eventually I was like, screw it, I'll do it myself and, um, started self-publishing and putting books that had reverted back to me out. Uh, and then, um, just through kind of going to conventions, buying agents beers at like the hotel bar and stuff like that, um, got not even like particularly like didn't sell the book that I was going to sell, like, and then, and then clown in the cornfield. So. Um, this is like a really, um, again, it takes a, like, there's like, it's like the iceberg thing. It's like, it's like, okay, well, publishing started with this, but there was like a huge preamble and a huge, a, like a, a huge process to it. I think that's probably universal no matter where, um, you start, but it's, yeah, that was, that was that. So I took the weird way into like, um, big publishing. Mm. And, and Kat, I think I, I read an interview that you didn't start seriously writing until your twenties. Yeah, I mean, I, I dabbled a bit when I was at university because mm -hmm. I was studying English with creative writing when I went to university. But 
Um, I then didn't even read a book for a few years after I left uni. I think I was just so burned out from mm. reading Daniel Deronda of all things. <laughs> ah, curse that book. Um, but then, yeah, when I was uh, 25 or so, I started reading YA and reading YA really sort of got me thinking I, I would love to write something in this age category. Um, so I had a go and my first manuscript was obviously terrible. I mean, you know, nobody sits down and writes something amazing. I'd like to tell myself that anyway. Um, so yeah, the first one that I wrote, it was dire, but I decided to query it because I didn't know any better. Um, I ended up getting an agent with another book, but then the first one that I wrote, I went back and revised it and it ended up coming out as my third book. So that was a, a sci-fi thriller called Purge. Yeah, but my, my debut came out in 2014, and that was a book called Blackfin Sky, hmm. which is a weird thriller, surprisingly enough. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like Laurel may have dropped off. We'll, we'll get her back. Um, but uh, in, in the meantime, I, I did want to talk about, I mean, you, Lorian, you mentioned it, the, the, obviously the pandemic, but so 2020, for whatever reason, right? I mean, I think we know some of the reasons, but what a year for horror, you know, I, like just some of the best horror releases it, it's oh we got laurel back sorry that's, that's okay so i we were just talking about 2020 being just i i think it's a watershed year for horror kind of across from middle grade to ya to adult horror fiction it's it's just been so great from the start of the year i mean my my to be read pile is just ridiculous so i just I'm curious to your thoughts of we'll start with you laurel um why do you think horror is so, I mean, it's in, there's a horror aisle again at Barnes and Noble. I mean, it feels like it's the, the mid nineties, which is really cool. Um, so why horror now? I'd say, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot that's going into it. Um, one, one aspect that I really appreciate is that with the, um, with the availability of so much self-publishing, um, I mean, yes, it, it can totally saturate the market, obviously, but I am telling you, I have read some of the most amazing self-published stuff this year yeah. um, that I, you know, that I would never have come across. And I'm so excited. And, you know, and a lot of times that it's just you hear voices that you're not going to necessarily hear in the mainstream market. And I really appreciate that. I have a I have a great love of diverse voices. Um, so I know that's got to be part of it. Um, and you know it's probably cliche, but it, this is this is a, a a kind of a rough time to be living in. And it's you know horror fans. It's funny. I I do. I, I said before I love the nostalgia of thinking what brought us to it in the first place because I love watching each of your faces. You had the same like little smile of happiness. You know, going back to that place. And I think that's how most horror fans feel. You know, whatever our love of the genre stemmed from, whatever our favorite part of it is, we have those little nostalgic memories of you know go into the library on a blustery October evening and checking out a whole bunch of, you know, ghost stories and things like that. And for me, like, I, I do have to sometimes um, alter my consumption of material when there's a lot of high anxiety. Uh, but there's still so much in the horror genre that feels comfortable to me. And it feels like, like a cozy place to cuddle into. So. How about you, Kat? Um come back to me sure yeah and you guys feel free to jump in whenever we don't have to go in order I, I do want to piggyback on something Laurel said and set up is I think the I think publishing takes a long time so you can't just be like well this is a reaction to 2020 mm -hmm. and it's it's right. clearly not but it also is like it also clearly is like what a great year for her I, I, I agree with that and I think Something Laurel said, like kind of, I, I hadn't put this together until now, but I think the the idea of not only self-publishing but small press and and medium press and and like the the prevalence of print on demand, and if you look at how many authors this year um, are like some of the biggest books are people who've been in the scene for a while. Like if like like Stephen Graham Jones, I like originally I the first time I read Stephen Graham Jones was, you know, with small press books, was 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 um, you know, broke Broken River books and mm -hmm. uh, and all these different like it came from Del Rio, I think was either a small press or a university press. So I think uh like I think it's partly like the market catching up to like this what Laura was saying, this this a little bit uh a more outside the box publishing a little bit more like things that are things that are clearly good and are undeniably good 
that are either small press or, or, or self-published or, or, or coming in at the fringes in some weird way um, and authors doing that that are, that are like finally, I think, big publishing somewhat catching – like because it's slow to move, but it's like finally catching up with like – I think if you go, if you go to, if you go to the, the horror aisle in your new you – know, your Barnes & Noble's new horror aisle, you'll see uh, Darcy Coates' books, which I, I believe those were small press to begin like, – so it's like they're – I think it's just – like almost like uh, the proving grounds now and the, and the, like the undeniableness of this fiction, you know, Laurel included, who is, you know, like, um, his recent ones out. Like, uh, I think it's when you get good press and when, you, when the scene is responding like that, I think editors and agents are, are, are looking at that stuff and are responding in turn, in turn and being like, Oh, actually we need something more like this. And, Maybe I don't know. I'm rambling. No, now, I, that that idea of every, like the mainstream catch. I mean, horror has always been mainstream. It's why horror movies always do as well as they do, right? But it it, it does feel like for whatever reason, publishing is recognized. I mean, there are so many amazing YA horror books. Uh, like that was, and frankly, and the, I, it was between middle grade and and YA was something that I I wasn't paying attention to, uh, you know, until the last couple of years. And it's so much fun going back and re like. Like you said, Lorian, like we had Goosebumps and Fear Street and Christopher Pike. It, like that's what we had. We, and there was no like it was like Benicula, uh, you know, it was James Howe, R.L. Stein, And then I was reading it, you know, like that was it. That was the track. Um, but yeah, interesting. How about you, Lorian? What do you think about 2020 and the horrors of this year? I think people read horror to escape horror. I mean, that's one of the reasons, like, it's a safe, it's a safe scary, like, you know, even all the horrible things that were in your guys' books, like, they're not really going to get me, at least I hope not. But I feel like horror is also, like, there's a lot of heart in the genre. And I don't think people who are, I think for a long time, people weren't recognizing that, like how heartfelt it really is and how it really is based on, it, it's, it's probably the most emotion-based genre, like I would argue. Um, and people can find solace in that and find like tender moments and like all of our books have loss in it and that's the scariest thing point blank in life the scariest thing is losing someone you love and horror like hits that at any for any age group it hits that like dead on pun not intended but like it really has us confront that and it totally is having a moment and i think some of that might be because of streaming like shutter and netflix and stranger things and like making it more mainstream and it's like oh wait that isn't this terrible you know demon genre that i don't want my kids to have any part of like this is fun this is heartfelt like i like this and so i feel like it becoming more mainstream has made it feel a little safer to people because there was i feel like a big drought for kids at least i'm going to speak about like the middle grade and young adult there was a big drought that I saw as a writer, as a reader, and as a teacher, you know, like you give a reluctant reader a book about monsters and they're going to gobble it up. And for the longest time, those were just considered lowbrow. Like you can't read something like that, that there's not, there's not enough in there for you to study or whatever. And we're kind of breaking through that thankfully and just saying yeah just read just read and it's becoming fun again and i really hope it stays because if anything has come out of 2020 we've got some damn good books that have come out of 2020 so and like horror specifically yeah i was actually that was my my follow-up question was what do you all think like what is the legacy of 2020 in terms of horror fiction i think we're going to look back at this as a watershed moment for the for the genre and like what what do you guys agree What like the thoughts on that am i just such a dork that that's what i want to think I anyone think it's definitely something that i mean 2020 has shown that you can never write something unbelievable now can you because <laughs> it's all happened you know we're facing a global pand pandemic we've got all the politics going on everything is just you know going to hell in a handbasket. So I don't think there really is anything, like there's no boundary you can't push now. Mm. So yeah, you know, horror is often the best way to explore pushing boundaries. So and we're not that's writing one of the reasons scary. why it's coming back. Mm. And we're like not writing the scariest thing anymore to your point. Not like the scariest things are out there, like actually mm. happening. So like our monsters and ghosts, they don't hold a candle. Yeah. Mm. 
my book's like partially inspired by the like the clown sightings of like 2017 where like people were catching these clowns on like video and stuff like that and i've been doing interviews now and it's like wasn't that cute wasn't that a cute thing wasn't that a cute thing to have anxiety about isn't that funny <laughs> like, <laughs> like... <laughs> i think the, the other thing especially about your four books is that they're they're really character pieces first and and like that that's why we you know the the the, the original halloween you care about laurie strode in the closet i mean you can't not right and i think all of your books start with character you know it's like yes there are monsters and scary things but like they're real i mean adam clown doesn't get crazy until about 100 pages in you know and and i think that that's super important and that was one of the things that i was uh surprised by because i like i said I, i've been hearing about your book for quite a while and i was like oh my god clown on cornfield this is just going to be wall to wall and i mean it was wall to wall but it was it was a character study, which yeah. took me by surprise. I think it's funny um, that I think it's funny because you can see I, like you try, I try not to like look at like Goodreads and stuff like that, but you can see people like when it comes up on Twitter, you can see people's like like when is this going to get scary? And I'm like I'm like well most slasher like I, I stick pretty close to like the slasher structure of like there's not a ton that happens in the first act of the slasher. You know it's usually like the kids showing up at the you know at the house or whatever. But I think you know um, so I like which I'm not like, I don't take offense to. I like, uh, and, and, and I, I get my fair share of, um, kicks in and, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and kills in. Uh, I just, I think the first, I, I actually forgot the question, but I think the, the most important thing, and I think half of us can attest is having a protagonist named Quinn is very important, um, to when you're writing a horror novel, uh, <laughs> Uh, the Stitchers has one of the one of the duo. His name is Quinn. So, um, what was the question? Again? <laughs> I I feel like I just had it was more of a comment on my part, but but I'll, I'll ask you a specific question. So you you come from adult fiction, and then you you know like you said you come into YA. Was there a line that you like while you were thinking was while you were writing? Was there a line in your head that you knew you couldn't cross? I mean, was it difficult to keep this within the confines of YA? Are there confines? I'll answer very briefly, and then I want my I want to make my question, and I'm going to make it a question for two of the other panelists because I they said something about this earlier, and I thought it was very interesting. Um, but for me, and again, coming from adult fiction, with like, 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 there's a person that gets eaten by a claw machine in in Zero Lives Remaining, like it's a haunted arcade story. Like, adult is like a, you know, there's there's more swears in him, but like, is there though? Because like, uh, there was nothing I ever I kind of gave the R rated um cut to uh my editor and kind of just didn't really we had a little bit of a conversation about like like the violence and, and language and, and things and like where where the line was and it seemed to me i had read a bunch of read a lot uh, in the years leading up to this of, of of ya horror and as there there did seem to be like gradations of of intensity but also um it didn't seem like there were any real restrictions so it's like if there's no restriction, if the only restriction is having a teen protagonist, I'm just going to kind of approach this the way I normally would, um, and that's that's how I approached it. But uh, both Lorraine and and, um, and Kat mentioned my age group. You said like you said something specifically about like when when considering my age group, I'd like to hear how, especially as um, I was a high school English teacher, so especially as a middle grade teacher, I wonder what your your take is on that i did think about my age group a lot because i do read adult horror and ya horror and i i as a teacher i think that helped me know the lines i kind of always was like okay when would this piss a parent off when would i get a parent phone call if i put this book in a kid's hand mm -hmm. when would i get the phone call or when would the principal call me in and say how did you give them that um so uh, with middle grade, you have to still make them feel safe. I think like, I do agree with you, Adam, that like the line between, and Kat, you can speak to this more, but like the line between young adult and adult is way less defined than middle grade to young adult. Um, middle grade, you can scare them, but you have to also give them like a heavy dose of heart. Like they have to feel hopeful. Whereas I don't know if you necessarily need to have your protagonist feel hopeful in young adult. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you can push it a lot more. Whereas in middle grade, if they don't feel that hope, 
I don't know if at that age group they would carry on. Yeah, I think it's, you know, what you're looking specifically at, you know, ending on a hopeful note or not. Um, I'm thinking now about um, The Bunker Diary by Kevin Brooks. Um, so that uh, it ends in a very sort of bleak way. Um, and a lot of people, I remember at the time because it was winning so many awards and things, um, a lot of people were saying this isn't for teenagers because, you know, there's no element of hope at the end of it. There's, you know, it ends on such this, you know, really bleak note. You know, how can you put this in the hands of teenagers? And I think maybe you know, the idea behind writing YA is that you always have to consider why you are pushing a certain boundary. And you know, if you're putting you know, gratuitous swearing or violence or sexual content in there, you have to consider why you're doing it. Um, mm. More so maybe than if you're writing for an older age group and certainly more than if you're writing for a younger age group. I know I tried writing a middle grade horror once and it just, it didn't work for me. It wasn't, it wasn't my right category, but uh, yeah, I so admire those who can write for the younger people. And uh, Laura, I had to, to ask about um, Crossroads seems so personal and I'm wondering if the book was difficult to write um, and how much of you is in Chris, your main character? Um, it, it actually really, wasn't that difficult to write um it which i kind of wonder if makes me seem kind of soulless because there's like you know i mean there's a lot you know that that goes on there there's a lot that i put chris through mm -hmm. um but uh, what i what i love about writing and what i love about creating is you know just like really getting into a character's head so i spend a lot of time um kind of building up who they are and thinking about how they would react to x situation and y situation um so with chris there are definitely elements of of things that I've experienced in in her life. Um, she's you know she's not me, but she has to be. I have to be partly her to be able to write her. Mm. It's kind of how I think about it. So um, definitely her you know her struggles with fertility. Uh, that was something that I went through and something that um, was I just felt like a perspective that I wanted to. To bring to it, um, and I have a, a stepson um, who is in his mid twenties, and he is perfectly fine and safe. But man, teenagers will scare you, and so there were definitely a few times when we were like, "Are we going to get that knock on the door?" You know. So it's not something that I wanted to think about, but um, it just kind of comes up in that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's it's it's kind of it's kind of a little bit of all of that. Hmm. And uh, Lauren, there, 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 obviously personal pieces in in the Stitcher. So I was wondering about how, um, I, I guess, writing a, as not a way of therapy, but like writing out. Um, well, maybe as therapy. I don't know. Maybe I will start from it there. Yeah, like because that, I think that's where that book kind of came from, right? Out of grief. Yeah, it it absolutely did. Like I had said before, like I had just moved back. My husband and I bought our first house in Stratford. Like a year before my dad like suddenly passed away and so here I was like in these old neighborhoods that I grew up in like surrounded by everything nostalgic and I kind of didn't know what to do with myself so we go on these like walks around I don't know the real name for it I call it Longbrook Pond um which is like right kind of in the center of Stratford and we would like go on these little twilight walks and we would just kind of talk and walk our dogs and I came up with the idea as we were on those walks and it just helped me. So like at first I was like, I'm gonna have fun. I need to like put my mind into something positive out of this. And it was the most therapeutic thing I've ever done, like way more than therapy. It definitely helped me like come to terms with my dad's sudden death by like giving Quinn a similar situation. And like Adam said before, like I totally try. I took Goodreads off my phone this week because I um, was looking at it like newbie, like not not paying attention. Everyone who says don't look at Goodreads, I looked and there were a bunch of people, like not a bunch, but like two, saying, "Oh, here's the trope of like losing a parent." And for me, I was like, "Oh, I can't look at things like that because this was so. This was more than that for me." And I think in horror, it is a trope, like to have someone you love pass because 
it's scary. Yeah. Like it's a genre. It's scary. And like I was saying before, like it's it horror gets you in touch with like those most basic raw human emotions. And death is a part of that. And it, you know, as someone who teaches, I always unfortunately have students who have lost parents. And I don't know, I feel like those stories kind of matter too. So for me, yeah, what we can we can totally call it therapy because I do think it was. I think it kind of got me through that really difficult you know, part of my life and let me kind of honor my dad in a way, you know. I see we, we have a question uh, from the audience from Len. So this one's for the group. Um, what is one of the biggest challenges writing horror compared to writing in other genres? And and maybe Kat, we could start with you because you primarily wrote thrillers before uh, Harrow Lake. So what are some of those challenges? Well, trying to write something that you know, we'll have at least on some level, um, universal scariness. Mm. I mean, so many people have different, you know, levels of, you know, what will actually scare them, you know, what type of things will be scary. And people don't go into horror, I don't think, anticipating that they won't get scared. They want to be scared, generally. I think people who read horror books, uh, probably, I mean, there's a lot of crossover with the people who ride roller coasters. You know, you like that adrenaline that you get from the safe kind of fear that you would have from reading a horror novel. So I think, yeah, it's probably that that would be the toughest part um, because you know, you know, the difference between writing a thriller, which just has to have, you know, the good pace, the tension, uh, you know, keeping things moving at, you know, a swift pace for the reader. Um, you don't necessarily need to have that same pacing with horror, but you do need to make sure that there are, you know, good scares in there. Hmm. How about you, Laurel? Um, I think it actually, I was kind of thinking about something that Kat, you said earlier when you guys were talking about, um, you know, determining the lines uh, when you're writing for younger audiences, um, which I think actually is something that would be applicable to really any age that you're writing. And that is thinking about how what you're putting in there serves the story. Um, so, you know, even though with adult horror fiction, there's not really any limits, um, but we look a lot at things like uh, there's discussion about trigger warnings and there's discussion about, you know, cancel culture and things like that and saying, oh, well, I can write whatever I want because, you know, I'm a writer, we can write what we want. And that's fine, you absolutely can. You know, you can write what you want, you can publish what you want, you can read what you want. Um, but something that I try to look at when I'm writing and also I'm, I'm working uh, right now with Gemma more on we're um, editing and curating a, uh, an anthology collection. And, you know, we one of the things that when we were kind of looking at our call on it, it's like, hey, you know, it's horror. We're not going to tell you don't have violence, don't have this, don't have that. But you have to ask, does it serve the story? And so the, the definition of gratuity on that changes vastly based on, you know, how you're looking at it. So, you know, is it is it something that when you when you read it, it really advances a story? You know, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of rambling now, but that's that's kind of where it is. It's like is looking at what am I doing here to create these scares and create this and and does it serve the story? Adam, you want to take it? Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything you just said. It is, it's funny because I was going to uh, like tack onto that the, the cat thing, uh, the idea of like, of like, yeah, I definitely do consider my audience, but I don't, I, I didn't mean to see, say like, like, oh, you know, they're kids, whatever. Like, I, of course I'm considering audience and I, but I'm also all, in the same way I'm right. I write adult fiction, consider like writing to theme and not so much, not even so much does it serve the story. Like, does it like, what will, yes, any, anyone can write a, a, a series of different beheadings. Anyone can write a series of different, um, you know, terrible things happening to the human body and to like, and to shock you and things like that. And, and I say this as someone who enjoys um, good extreme horror, someone who enjoys Clive Barker and Jack Ketchum and someone who enjoys like ex the more extreme side of uh, the genre. But there's within that subcategory is where you get into the, 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 the kind of, it's a straw man argument because no one's here to defend themselves, but what Laurel's saying, like the, like, it's hard, I could write whatever I want. Like anyone who has to say that sentence probably hasn't justified what they've written. And they're probably 
you probably have to block them on Facebook. Like uh, it, uh, just to be like, just to completely paint with a kind of broad brush. Um, like, it, like, like, look, I, 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 my first two books were called extreme horror. I didn't really think so. But then again, like, you know, different people, you know, eating human fingers does different things for different people. Like, uh, like, uh, but I, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, like, uh, Yes, go as extreme as you want, go as crazy as you want. There's no taboo in horror. Horror should push boundaries, of course, mm. but it should inform either story or theme. Or why are you like? It's not if your book's not about anything. If your story's not about anything in the in the like capital A about, then why am I reading it? Is 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 my take? Um, and I'm 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 all for the kind of aesthetic pleasures, the quick aesthetic pleasures of like a well constructed um, uh, set piece. But usually those fit into uh, novels or stories that 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 have a theme, that have a that have a plot, that have a reason to be. Um, this is my take. Lauren. I was just gonna say, don't even ask me, Alex, because I can't say it better than they just did. <laughs> I'll just say I concur. <laughs> Well, all right, so I'll start with you on this one then, because I do want to talk to you specifically about this and then open it up to the group. You all had the honor of releasing a book into a pandemic, right? So I want to talk a little bit about that experience, what it was, what that was like. Uh, and Lauren, if you could talk a little bit about the Mill Ground Book Fest, that would be awesome because that's a super cool thing. Well, that's something positive. I'm going to be positive. If, like, I, on one hand, I don't know what I'm missing. Like, I see people who have, like, more books out than me who are, you know, saying, oh, I can't do author visits for the writing for kids, or I can't do book events, or I couldn't go to Comic-Con, or I couldn't do this. I've never done any of that stuff anyway, so I don't really know what I'm missing. I do know that um, I'm able, I've been able to do more virtual events that people probably wouldn't have paid me to go to otherwise. Like, I'm not I'm not someone who's going to draw crowds so I'm not someone they're going to fly anywhere but to have me just you know zoom in it it's kind of opened up more doors I think for me in that way to help me build a bit of a readership um because you are starting from nothing like as a debut I don't have a readership or anything so like the horror community has been so nice especially because I feel like I'm so on the periphery since I do write for kids and I think some people have gotten my book and or like it's not scary enough. It's like it's for twelve year olds. But you know. <laughs> um, but Middle Ground Book Fest was a really bright spot that came out of um, twenty twenty. My friends and I are, are all debuts, and we write in different genres. I'm the only horror writer, but we all write for middle grade, and we were just like, "What are we gonna do this summer? Let's just put on a virtual book event." And that's pretty much what we did. And in like a month, we arranged one, and we put it on, and it just highlighted debut middle grade writers with some non debuts too. Um, but it was just like a ridiculous thing that we just took on randomly, like friends in a group chat, like how about we do this thing and then we did it and it came out to be something that we were all really proud of and we had a really diverse, like authentically diverse lineup. And I feel like as a middle school teacher, I see teachers who have so much to do, I get it. And they have the same books in their classrooms every single year. And it's always like wonder or whatever. And it's like the one book that's being talked about. And then they wonder why kids don't like to read or say they don't like to read. And this festival kind of let us share with teachers and librarians, like look at all the amazing books that have just come out in the last couple of years, like go forth and buy them and support these writers and like get your kids into books. Like if I walk into my classroom, like, hey, I just got this new book. It just came off the shelf. They're dying for it. They don't even care what it is. They're just like, <laughs> give it to me because they see the same books on the shelves every single year. So yeah, Middle Ground was a, a bright spot. One of the one of our founders lives in the Philippines. She's never would have been able to do any kind of event if, you know, things hadn't gone virtual. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of a you know, a little bright spot. So thank you for asking about that festival. Yeah, and we're and anyone who wants to check it out, because the panels are up on YouTube, correct? Yeah, uh, they're so up. We have the, the the link, the URL is in the chat. So definitely check that out after this panel. Um, thank you for adding that there. Oh, thank you for doing it. Super. It was awesome. Um, as someone who also does a festival, I know how difficult <laughs> festivals are. Um, 
anyone else want to hop in on that? On the, the release in the book and the, yeah, go ahead, Kat. Um, you're sort of tapping in on what Lorian was saying there. You know, being in the UK, it's, you know, I wouldn't be on a panel with you guys ordinarily. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one positive that's come out of this whole, you know, awful experience. Um, you know, naturally, I was looking forward to doing big events and mm -hmm. going out and meeting people in the UK. The book came out here in July and then August in the States. So, mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't have been out in the States anyway doing events, but as everything's gone virtual now, I've had the opportunity to do a lot more. So that's, you know, one little bright note for me. <laughs> for sure. For us, too. Thank you. <laughs> Adam, Laurel. Laurel. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I created that confusion. Let's we'll go Laurel first, then Adam. How's that? <laughs> um, I, I I guess in some ways I kind of don't really know what I'm missing either. Uh, Crossroads was my second release, but Whispers in the Dark was um, also put out by a small press, and I did not know what I was doing with any kind of self promo. Um, I, I guess I didn't realize you had to do anything, so I I spent most of 2019 kind of clawing my way into any kind of notice. And so with Crossroads, um, I think most of the festival, I was gonna do Scares That Care, but a lot of the ones oh, that I was gonna sign figure. up for, right? <laughs> I know. You're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, but, um, but my book wouldn't have been out yet in any way. So I feel like that was mostly just for like socialization purposes. So for me, um, Off Limits Press, I know Sam Kilyasnik gets so tired of me talking about her probably, but she is, an amazing, amazing publisher to work with. Ridiculously good writer too. True crime, unbelievable debut. Um, she, you know, she debuted this year too. Um, and uh, just, it was the difference in what, you know, because she's a small press too, uh, but she really got the word out. It was very grassroots. It was very, you know, getting in touch with the horror community and getting people excited about it. And I just couldn't be happier with how the release went. And um, the, I think the only main difference that I, I really, I wanted to throw a party. I'm Southern and I like to feed people so much. So I was gonna, you know, I've, I've got an old friend who has this great catering company and I've got friends who bake and I'm like, I'm just gonna throw money and feed everybody and have an open bar. And I couldn't do that. Mm. Um, but I, I kind of did an online event and sent people chocolate and bourbon. So that was, you know, it was, it was a pretty good, uh, pretty good replacement. Cool. Yeah. I, uh... I have nothing much to add other than like, I feel like I, because I had launched so many books at, with small presses and like, and, and the idea of like, of like, oh, and I think it's something that maybe a lot of people um, who are small press, like, like the idea that like, oh, you're going to get into a, a big press. It's a big New York press. And they're going to, they're going to roll out the red carpet for you. And you're going to have every like promotional tool at your disposal. It's not really true. It's not true at all. But I had been doing like so much. Just, I'm just like I'm all over like the internet. I'm on like Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on I'm on YouTube. I do YouTube. So like I've been doing all these kind of like quasi like self promotional brand building things anyway. Um, that it that it didn't like yes I wanted to go to the con so bad because I love. I, every t-shirt I have is like this. I have, I, this is, this is the, this is not a costume. This is a way of life. <laughs> like I am, I am like the, the con rat kid who grew up like waiting in line for Robert England's autograph and stuff like that. Like I, I'm that guy. Um, so I love going to conventions and I love selling my books at conventions cause I'm a motor mouse and a salesman. So like, I love that. Like I love shaking people's hands and being like, you're not leaving this table till you get one of these books, like that kind of thing. Like, I, I love that. I love that element of it. And it's got, that's gone now. And so like, uh, you know, a huge part of what I a lot enjoyed about being a writer and about, you know, selling books is kind of taken away, but you compensate, you, you mm -hmm. find other ways of doing it. And I, 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 I got, I was just, I felt very lucky and very supported by Harper teen uh, with clown and cornfield and the way that they helped me, launch it in the way that they were like okay when I was like I want to do weird things like and and well, trust me this will be funny if I do this on Twitter and they're like that doesn't sound like a good idea but okay like 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 they, like that like you know I they're like I I felt very supported and and, and it wasn't ideal but it I think everyone tries to make the best of everything so 
I got a fun one from Deborah. So whoever wants to take this one can can hop on it. Um, so Deborah asks, "Why do I love reading horror, but I don't like horror movies?" I think it could be because you have so much more control over it with a book. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of tell when something's coming, and even if it comes at you, you can slam that book show closed and put it down and come back to it later. But horror is an image that the the movie comes at you. So even if you're racing to go pause it or turn it off, you've already got that image in your head. Mm. Yeah, I'm looking at, I'm pretty sure it was page 70 where I had to close yours for a moment. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Anyone else want to want to weigh in on that or, or should I go to Eric? That's a great answer. You're yeah. your own cinematographer if you're, yeah. uh, if you're reading a, a book instead of watching a movie. That's a great, that's a great answer. Um, so Eric asks, uh, are there too many restrictions about certain content in horror from publishers? Um, I've seen things like no stories that contain violence towards animals. I have a dog and a cat and love them both very much, but in fiction, is that going too far? So content restrictions from publishers. Thoughts? It probably depends on the age group for one. I probably... I probably couldn't do that in middle grade, um, but I don't know. I haven't like my editors always like scarier, 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 go scarier, and I'm like, is this too much? She's like, no, you need to go harder. So I don't know. It might depend on like personal preference of an editor because they're human and they have their own like you know triggers that maybe is too much for them or not. But I don't know. You guys might know more. What was the question asker's name? Uh, Eric. Eric, I, I, I feel like I see a lot of that. It, it's talking about um, Laurel um, reading through slush piles and reading through open calls for an anthology. Like, I feel like I do see a lot of that on, um, on like open calls, like not so much with like, with like agents and stuff like that or edit editors, but like, if, if you're going to send us a story, try not to have, you know, this, this, and this like violence to children or violence to animals. Like um, I, it probably is just like a, an earnest, like when you see it on like submission guidelines, it probably is just like a, let's try to filter out like the, the you know like the 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 like the the people who are going hardest to try to shock like let's try to encourage a little bit of um not that i necessarily agree with it because there's plenty of um you know there's plenty of horror films and plenty of horror books where violence is done to animals violence is done to children I, and i and I, I really enjoy the books and i really enjoy the films uh it probably is one of those things of just like if you're going to get a thousand stories in your in your gmail inbox you want to make sure like you're not getting uh, a thousand like snuff pieces like mm -hmm. yeah and to clarify eric in the comments says that yes he's talking about uh, anthology specifically yep it probably i just that i bet it's i bet it's because like i've read slush before like when i was in college i was like oh I'll, I'll help out at like a small press publisher and they were like great here's the email and it just was like uh like and it, i found a lot of great stories but like you get a lot of like hello dear editor like here is the I did not mean to give them any kind of Southern accent, Laurel. That was not that, that was not uh, meant to be a regionalism. I did. I just I didn't realize I was doing it. Uh, like I think you get a lot of like like nothing has a capital in it. All run on sentences, and it's like, would you like to hear what I would like to do to my neighbor and her dog? Like it's like no, I'm I'm good. Like you get a lot of that. So I think it's probably just that. Like. It, it, I think it could be tone of an anthology too. I mean, and this is I don't know how anyone ended up letting me do this because I'm not really a writing grown up. So I don't know how I ended up working on this Santo, but um, you know, I, there, there was a specific tone really that we were looking for. And it was kind of just like, you know, definitely horror uh, and we have no problem with extreme, but it, it's like, it was very much about um, just the experience of being a woman and the horror aspects of that. And we've gotten this just amazing, amazing range of things. So we didn't put any cap on it like we don't want this one particular thing but we did say you know um not rape for the sake of rape not you know mm -hmm. gratuitous sexual assault like that because there there is the experience of that that you deal with on the page you know and then there is you know the the i guess just gratuity for entertainment purposes so but there could also be another antho that is specifically looking for you know just a completely different tone so it just from my very minimal experience i would say it might just be a tone that they're going for mm. cool. 
Um, so I just, as we're, we're kind of running out of time and it's, it's way tomorrow for cat. So I have a couple of really quick, quick hits to, to end it on. Uh, so if we could just go around, let's do, cause it is, I mean, we're in mid October, we're getting close. So what's a favorite Halloween ritual or, or, uh, activity for everybody. Carving pumpkins. Hmm. Classic. Taking my kids trick or treating. Mm -hmm. Well, funny, funnily enough, um, Adam saying that he likes carving pumpkins. I have never ever done it, but this year I have one ready to carve. Oh, awesome. so that'll be a new tradition. <laughs> Kat, can I just say I, my husband's British and I moved to England like after college to Bristol guns blazing for Halloween. Like I was dressed up. I decorated our whole apartment. I sat outside with all my candy and everyone walked past me. And finally I asked this woman, I was like, I have candy. Like I have candy right here. And she goes, you just look too eager and walked past me. <laughs> 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 I, I may have cried. So. And can I hear you're a ghost hunter as well? I'm sorry. Are you a ghost hunter? I am. Yes, I, I like to go ghost Thank hunting. You. I've never seen one, by the way, mm, before okay. you all you know, class me as a weirdo. <laughs> but yeah, I like to look for them. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> Sorry, Laurel, I stepped on you. Oh, no, you're you're good. Um, we, I mean, same kind of thing. I have a, just boxes and boxes worth of decorations because I've never stopped buying them. Mm -hmm. um, but one kind of fun thing this year has been kind of figuring out what I can have what I can decorate with and what my son can help me with that's not incredibly breakable and or, uh, you know, injury causing. So that's, he's, he has kind of his own pumpkin patch now that he's created. So we're, we're having fun merging those two worlds. Did, did anyone splurge on the 12 foot Home Depot skeleton? I, I saw my yeah. first one this weekend and I was driving the car. My wife, I was like, I was like, get a picture, quick, get a picture. And I was like, we almost <laughs> crashed, but I was like, quick, get a picture of it. <laughs> it was amazing. It was cool. I, 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 we we're going to get one. <laughs> She's in the other room. She probably, are we going to get one? <laughs> I think I, she didn't say anything, but yeah. That means yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. you get the, just get the, I hear you. They're on like back order too, which is crazy. Um, okay, so here's a question that I've stolen from the internet, so you know it's good. Um, I saw this going around today. If uh, so, if authors covered novels the way that musicians cover songs, which covered novel would you be most excited to read? And uh, the example they gave was like J.R.R. Tolkien's The Bible. Um, I'll give one: Gwendolyn Keist's Dracula would be something that I'd want to read. So I'll give everybody a second, but. Is this a book we want another author to write or one that we want to cover? Oh, you could do that too. Either, either one. It, it was, it was um, I think it was taken as uh, another author doing it, but yeah, no, I'd be interested to see what you'd want to write. I'd want to write the most ridiculous thing. I would want to write X-Files fan fiction. <sighs> so like I middle, like middle grade, because obviously, but <laughs> yeah. I if think you I, write it, I'll read it. I think I didn't follow the rules. I'm sorry, Alex, but I would want to yeah. <laughs> I would, I would want to read. read go, um, oh, go ahead, Kat. Sorry. Sorry. Um, Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca may be done by somebody like Joe Hill. I think. Mm. Yeah, really. Good one. Push it over that line. Yeah. Real scares in there. I think that would do do a lot for me. I want to read Jonathan Jans's Jaws. Oh, I think he, he loves did it. an amazing job with it. that. It's a fantastic movie, and I've heard not an awesome book. So I would love to see what he would do with that book. That's a good one. Oh, this, is, this is such a hard question. Um, it's not hard. <laughs> you can. Uh, yeah, it's answer. like it's like impossible. It's also like yeah. it's like um, I don't know. Like like I th I think of like the old like. I think of like, uh, I'm reading uh, because of Bly Manor. I'm like, oh, let me read Turn of the Screw and I'll read it like a bedtime story. I'll read it mm -hmm. aloud. Um, and the language is beautiful, but it's so clearly different. Yeah. Like I'd love like a, you know, uh, like a Haruki Murakami writing like like his his Turn of the Screw or something like that, which is, oh, no. it's a weird, a weird combination, but something like, someone like who's, who's incredibly matter of fact about their writing mm -hmm. doing that. Like, cool. All right, so last question. Um, 
because we you know, we talked about elevating voices earlier. So if, if we could go around and and maybe just uh, tell everybody a book that you you're either reading or you've read uh, in the last few months that that's kind of stuck with you. Um, and if you want to shout out your local bookstore, uh, because we all know bookstores are are having a real hard time right now. Uh, so yay indie bookstores. Lorian, do you want to start? Sure. All right, I'm going to keep it middle grade horror. I brought a prop. It. Hide and Seeker by Deka Herman. She it just came out last month. Um, Deka wrote this like she didn't know she was writing a creepy story, but it's it's so scary. It's like about a hiding hide, hide and seek game that has gone terribly wrong, and a kid mm -hmm. disappears for a year, and he comes back, and he's like totally not like the same kind of kid. Um, so I suggest you buy Hide and Seeker by Deka Herman from RJ Julia Independent Booksellers in Madison, Connecticut. You said that was middle grade? Yep. That sounds really good. Uh, it's, it sounds similar. That wasn't gonna be, I, I had props too. I was gonna hold up this one. I will in a second, but um, the Rachel Harrison's, if you wanna read an adult version of a, a similar premise, Rachel Harrison's uh, The Return is about uh, a, a woman in a, a college friend group who goes uh, dis who disappears for two years and then comes back. Um, it's it, I I loved it. talk about like a strong year for horror. I, I that's the book that I keep coming back to like mm -hmm. thinking about. Um, I, I I love that book and uh, I think it just came out in paperback. It did. Yeah. Um, it and did. also so that's Rachel Harrison's The Return. I'm sorry I'm taking two, but I want to talk. About I like two. that one. Um, Ghostwood Song by Erica Waters, which is a a, a YA. Um, ghost story but like the ghosts are almost incidental even though there's like a ton of ghosts it's like also like a mystery about uh, other stuff but it i like it because it has a really strong um southern gothic feel to it um but uh, but like like the florida panhandle south and, it, and it's about kids that are that enjoy playing like music enjoy playing like in bluegrass bands and stuff like that so like the the musical like references and, and points of reference were so unique and so um I thought it's very specific and not a lot that I, that I see in YA, so I thought that was really good. So that's Ghostwood Song by Erica Waters. And, uh, our local bookstore up here is uh, Head House Books, and I think they are doing online uh, shipping, so right here in Philadelphia. So, Laurel? Um, I, I'm going to say uh, Cynthia Paleo's um, Into the Woods and All the Way Through uh, was just recently released. It's poetry. Um, and she, it's, it's true crime horror poetry. Um, she worked as a journalist for a number of years and did a lot of research into missing women um, and just the, the number of times that not much is done and they don't get found. Um, and it's utterly heartbreaking and just very, the, the poems are very short. They're very get right to it. They're beautiful. And she includes just a little bit of information about the missing woman at the end of each of them. Um, and that's just really, really powerful. It's, um, it's, it's beautiful. Um, and we actually have two great independent bookstores here. We have Joseph Best Booksellers and also Wild Figs. So shout out to both of them. So I'm going to give a, a shout out to uh, Teeth in the Mist by Dawn Kurtigich. Yep. This is a YA Gothic horror and it's inspired by the legend of Faust and set in the Welsh mountains. And, you know, as I'm coming to you from Wales right now, I thought I would give a shout out to something local. Um, and my local bookshop would be the bookshop in Mould. Very cool. I'm writing all of these down. Um, so thank you all. I'm going to just just say full disclosure. Uh, the four of you, I, I asked you all to come because I wanted to read your books real bad. So this allowed me to read it on, we read your books on work time. So thank you. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> this, this is it really guys, like this is my favorite part of the job. It's just such an honor to, to speak to you all. Thank you all for taking the time. Um, good continued luck on, on, on projects. And I, I can't wait to see what you all come out with next. Um, and everybody watching, thank you all for being here with us. Um, this, we, it'll record right at this link. So if you wanna check the replay, it's right here. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Stay safe, stay well, and uh, we will see you in the next one. Good night, everybody, and happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Halloween.